as I pointed out, uh, we uh, are repairing our projector. <clears throat> and so you had to hear from our chorister, and you'll hear for the first time from me since we've been together, uh, that you had to hear from our chorister, would you open your hymnals too? Um, and today I get to say to you, would you open your Bibles too? Hebrews chapter one, and so, and if you, if, if you complain about it, I don't think your complaint is gonna go too far because the headline would say, pastor forces church to read their Bibles. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think I'm gonna get in trouble for that, so. But we'll be in Hebrews chapter one is about where we are, and, uh, and hopefully next week we, we could uh, be back into the at least early 20th century, and I'll have them up there for you, so. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from that majesty of glory. That's what Ed just read to us. And that's the witness of Peter himself. That's the witness of, uh, not arguably, the chief disciple. And that is his testimony. We heard the voice from the majesty of glory. And it's been speaking now for quite a while. According to the author of Hebrews, in chapter one, it says, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. And as Peter concluded, the author of Hebrews concludes also, but in these last days, in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. The last word in the last days is his son. The final word, the final name in the last days, if you were to sum up the last day message, it's one word, it's one name, it's Jesus, period. The relationship with the prophets, as the author of Hebrews puts it, the relationship with the prophets was not wrong, it was not insufficient for its time, I would argue this, it was sufficient for its time, and God always gives us what is sufficient for our time. Wherever we're at, wherever we're sitting right now, the revelation that God has given us of Jesus means that it's for us right now. But it doesn't mean that it'll be sufficient for tomorrow. Because if we believe that God came to walk and to talk with us, that means he walks and talks with us tomorrow, revealing himself more to us, which means yesterday's revelation is insufficient. It may give us memories, it may give us foundation, but it is insufficient for tomorrow. The relationship with the prophets was probably sufficient for one reason, and that was it is exactly what the people wanted. It's, it's what they wanted. See, if you were to ask Jesus, though, his one desire, in John chapter 17, verse 24, he says, Father, I desire that those whom you've given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you gave me because you loved me, before the foundation of the world, to sum up God's covenant with his people, given so many years ago, to Adam and then on to the fathers, to Adam and Eve and on to our ancestors, as the, the uh, author of Hebrews says, if you were to sum it up, that would be his desire is to be with us and for us to be with him. He simply wants to walk and talk with his children. For how long? Well, forever. See, when Jesus asked for uh, his, you know, I, I have one desire, Lord, that you've given me, that they may be with me, that all of them that you've given me be with me where I am. And we know in just a day, he's going to be crucified and then resurrected. And within a month, he's going to be in heaven with the Father, which means his desire is eternity to be with us and for us to be with him. And there's only one condition to any of that, that it would be based on love. 
that we would come to desire to walk with him because we have fallen in love with him because he has loved us first. It's the only condition to the covenant. The condition is love. See, the covenant is offered as a face-to-face proposition. Adam and Eve, the covenant was given to them. Noah, the covenant was given to them. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, all were offered this relationship, a face-to-face relationship, if you will. The next line in the covenant gives it a special face, gives it a special name, and will eventually give it a, uh, a place to dwell, if you will. But those children of that grandfather Abraham came to find themselves enslaved by a pagan Egyptian empire for over 400 years. People who served these angry Egyptian gods, these made up gods, if you will. People who served these gods every day would beat and starve and sap the strength and steal the will of the ancestors of God's covenant people. And I uh, have always argued that the rank and file of Israel in that day probably barely remember, if at all, the promise to this distant grandfather called Abraham. In other words, I'm not sure that they even realized or knew who this God was when Moses shows up and says, I've come from the God of your fathers. The answer had to be what? Who? Who? So these are the people, maybe a million or so, that now get to carry the name, the face, and hopefully now a land of the covenant that they're coming to. And this one man, this one father, if you will, the voice uh, that, that the author of Hebrews said, it was given to our fathers. This one man now leads this maybe possibly uh, two and a half, at least one million to two and a half million of uh, Abraham's grandchildren across the desert to find this land, if you will. One promised to their grandfather. Abraham was told as part of the covenant. First of all, those children were part of the covenant, weren't they? He told Abraham, go out, go out and Count the stars, and if you can, that's your seed. That's who they'll be. Well, now they're numbering about a million, and there they are. And Abram happened to be standing in Canaan at that particular time, and he said, walk the breadth of this land. I'll give this land to those children eventually. And so one of these prophets that Hebrew says is one of the ones that is now leading them to the promise fulfilled in this covenant. And over the next months, he's going to bring them to a special place. There's a stop. Well, because of the people, there's a bunch of stops they have to make, right, between between Egypt and Canaan. A whole bunch of stops, but one very special one. It was the one that he sent Moses there in the first place for. It was at the foot of that mountain called Sinai. So he brings them to Sinai. This is the place where these chosen children of Abraham broke their real father's heart, I believe. Broke God's heart because they were willing to put conditions or wanted to put conditions on the covenant that God never intended, that he did not want. Moses brings them to this mountain and what God offers them is what he had offered Moses 40 years ago, about 40 years ago. Exodus 33, verse 11 says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. See, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, he then tells Moses, who they've been speaking now, face to face, he tells him, I'll send you to Pharaoh now. You go get my people. Go get Abraham's kids and bring them here, out of Egypt. And verse 12, he says, and I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. So if you think about it, what Moses is offering the children of Israel is what God offered Moses about 40 years ago, which Moses, by the way, happily 
took. He asked this friend of his now, his friend Moses, to bring all of Abraham's children. Bring them to me, Moses, so that I can keep my promise that I made to you and your grandfather, Abraham. Bring them to the mountain so I could offer this friendship that you and I have, so I can offer it to them. He gets there. He puts them through three days of elaborate preparation. Elaborate preparation. And then something special happens on the third day. Exodus 19, 11 says, prepare for the third day, he says, because on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. See, he was making the site sacred. He was making it absolutely sacred. He said, prepare for it. Put boundaries around it. Don't let anybody come near it. Don't let anybody touch it. It's for a particular purpose. But what made it sacred was just that. What made it sacred was, was that he was going to come down. He was going to occupy that space. That's what made it sacred. Some more instructions to be careful not to defile, not to touch. Verse 13 says, no hand shall touch. Uh, If somebody wanders into the boundary, boundary, don't go after them. Don't go after them. Shoot them if you have to. Stone them if you have to. That's how sacred this place was. And then at the end of that horrible verse where they're given instructions to not go near, not go in, the line says, and when the trumpet sounds a long blast, tell them they may go up the mountain. Wow. See? The invitation to Israel was the same invitation that Moses heeded. Moses' invitation was a little different. He looked up from tending the sheep and there was a sign that caught his eye, a burning bush that would not burn up. That was God saying, Moses, come on up. And when he got there, what did he find? He found a God willing to talk to him. And Moses unwilling at first, still a bit more unwilling, and even up to this point right here is still a tad unwilling, right? Because every time something goes wrong, he comes to God and he lets God know, you know what, How, why, why'd you get me into this? And of course, Israel accepted this invitation. They went up the mountain when they heard the trumpet and they lived happily ever after, didn't they? When all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking, They were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance. I'm not sure if if you've noticed before, I think I pointed this out a couple years ago, but something happens between chapter 19, 13, and up until this point. Does Exodus 20, 1 through 17 ring a bell with anybody? Especially any seasoned Seventh-day Adventist here? Does Exodus 20 read a bell? Ring a bell? (laughs) What do we find there? We find the 10 what? Find the 10 commandments. And does anybody notice that the Ten Commandments at this particular time were not written down? They were spoken by God face to face. And of course we go, no, wait a minute, that wasn't in the movie. But the first time that God gives the commandments to them, he doesn't write it in stone. He speaks it to them face to face. He only writes it in stone after they refuse this face to face relationship. That's when he has to write it in stone. And I believe, I I, I didn't misquote, I believe he had to. He didn't want to, but he had to. Because this is what they wanted. They begin to place distance between themselves and God. For one reason and one reason alone, we are afraid. This was the whole purpose of the Exodus. Moses, bring me Abraham's kids, all children to me. I want to talk to them. The thunder is there, yes, the lightning is there, but what else was there? It says the thunder, the lightning, and the trumpet. God wouldn't say, hey, come up the mountain or the trumpet is going to be a signal. He wouldn't say that and then bury the trumpet somewhere. It was all right there. What did they choose to focus on? 
By the way, not totally unreasonable after 400 years of serving human, cruel, torturous, hideous gods of Egypt. I don't think it's unreasonable at all for the Israelites to be just a tad skeptical when some voice calls to them from a mountain. But the trumpet is blowing. They hear it. They have to. Moses said that they did. Moses says that they do. And here's where I believe it broke his heart. They broke his heart. Because in verse 19, they say to Moses, you speak to us. We will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. See, after 400 years, they're a whole lot more comfortable with powerful gods, especially gods that exhibit power upon humans with no love, no uh, affection, nothing, no understanding. After 400 years of serving people who serve those gods, this one on Sinai just sounds like just another one. What do they miss, though? What they miss is one guy, one prophet, standing there saying, guys, I, 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 I get it, I get it. But I've been face to face with him for 40 years now. You know what? And it's pretty cool. Come on up. And they say, no way, no how. So from then on, the distance that they ask for, God begins to grant them. The distance that they want, God begins to grant them. So distance now becomes a a currency, if you will. It becomes the currency of the covenant. Wasn't God's idea, was it? So you could look at it as kind of a plan A, plan B scenario. Israel refuses plan A. God has to come up with what? With plan B. But it isn't his. I had an Old Testament professor in seminary said, I, I, you know, I could go through now and say that God is probably at about plan Z. As a matter of fact, God probably has exhausted the alphabet and it's, we're probably in plan 119 right now. But distance is now the father and his children. I always think of the, the parable of the prodigal son while he was yet still far off, the father saw him. The distance between the son and the father was comfortable for the son, but it wasn't for the father. It never has been. So yes, he then gives prophets who begin to speak, prophets who will have a relationship for them. And he'll begin, to, he'll begin to give measures that continue to put this distance. The priesthood, another distance between the God who's worshiping and the worshipers. That, that's not good enough for Israel. Then they'll put monarchs in there. And now all of a sudden, kings have the relationship for God, with God for the people. And it just keeps getting further and further and further. Until by Jesus' day, God, very God standing in front of them, the distance that they've chosen to use is his very word. There's no way you can be the one of God. And you know what? The Bible says so. (laughs) Right here. So now, even the Bible, that written down word, the tablets become the distance. And all the while, the message has never changed for 6,000 years. I just want to walk with you and talk with you. And I'll take whoever will do that with me. A couple of prophets here and there couple of patriarchs here and there until one day the word will become flesh and walk among us. So God long ago, he said, long ago, I'm sorry, I have to apologize to the online people. I, I was trying to give them the verses and I just went through and didn't give him any of them, so... I really got into that you guys were reading your own. But long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. So they want the distance. They want the intermediary. The mystery of the majesty of of God is too great to them at the moment. Fear is now uh, how they react to him. 
And he gives them that. He gives them that. But he, I, I think what he did with us, with them, is that he fooled them just a little bit. He fooled them. He said, okay, you want me to stay up on the mountain? But what is a prophet except his presence off the mountain walking around in human flesh, amen? So he fools them a little bit, doesn't he? I'll stay on the mountain, but I'll send you my spirit of prophecy. It's simple. The spirit of prophecy is his willingness to continue to be present with a people who no longer want his presence. Sometimes it goes well. Uh, Well, sometimes it goes well for the people. It never goes well for the prophet, does it? What did Jesus say that, that they did with every prophet that God sent them? Didn't go well for Abel to Zechariah, did it? From A to Z. But the spirit of prophecy is his willingness to present with his people, to present his presence with his people. It's a combination of presence, but in their flesh. See, the human gods created are always ruling from far off. Ra orbits with the sun and rules from far off. Zeus sits on Olympus. Mankind is forced to come up with some sort of representation that they can grab onto and control. Why? Because they can't trust these faraway gods. You anger Ra and he will burn the skin off of you. You anger the Nile and he'll make sure that he floods you out. So idolatry is humans trying to get control of this. Here we are, right? Trying to survive. Operating on a currency of distance and fear. So that's why God says, don't don't worship any gods with likenesses or images. Don't worship what I created as creation. Don't worship them as you would the creator. So God is trying to buy their trust, earn their trust, point it out to them. At a a painstaking pace, amen? 6,000 years, still going along. He's saying, God, can't you just speed it up a little bit? He said, I would, but love doesn't allow me to. The speed of the farm the speed of the kitchen, the speed of yeast in dough. So in the midst of all this, this 400 years of this, this God comes along to these bedraggled, tortured slaves, a voice that spoke to their ancestor, and he brings what? Does he bring power? Yes. Yes but he also brings something else that those other gods simply do not offer. The Lord says to Moses, I have observed the misery of my people uh, who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and I have come down. They're never in a million years going to hear that from Ra. Ra. They're never in a million years going to hear that from Zeus. They're never in a million years going to hear it from any one of the gods that they worship that crawl and creep and swim in the Nile or in the desert or anywhere else. I have come down because my people are suffering. They need me. They need something. They need a good land, a broad land, one flowing with milk and honey. But what he offers is what no other God can offer, and that is his presence. He speaks to the prophets, his messengers, his presence. They were satisfied with their relationship through Moses with God. But God has always offered his presence So he says, long ago, the prophets used to speak. Long ago, I used to speak through them. But in these days, I found the better way. I found the ultimate way. I just got to get him from Sinai to when my son is born in Bethlehem. 
So in Hebrews chapter one, that's about the prophets. Are there other messengers according to Hebrew chapter one? Are there other messengers that God brings? See, the word prophet, nevi, where, we, uh, where nevi'im would be a plural in Hebrew. Nevi simply means messenger. That's all it means. It simply means messenger. Are there other messengers that carry God's message? See, there's another word, especially in Greek, that simply means messenger. And in Greek, the word is angelos. In English, it's the word angel. To come right down to it, all an angel is, is a messenger from who? Is a messenger from God. So he has other messengers. What are the other messengers in the Bible? Is that they're angels. Now, what's interesting is, is that I don't know, we're not 100% sure of the everyday listener who would be reading the letter to the Hebrews, a Hebrew, a, a Jewish believer in Jesus, if you will, back then, because that's who this letter is written for. This letter is written for those messianic Jews. It's specifically for them. It's not like Romans, who's written to both Jews and Greeks, and it's not like uh, Galatians. It's pretty much written to all Gentiles. This one is specifically written to Jewish believers, to Hebrews. And according to these first two chapters, in this idea of these prophets and these uh, various ways, the other source of this messaging happens to be angels. It has to be because it spends an entire half, three quarters of this chapter and all of next chapter talking about our relationship with angels. So I'm not sure what their relationship was, how common it was, what they were looking for in them. I think of Peter being imprisoned in, in, in Acts chapter 12, right? He's imprisoned, he's asleep, he's just, he's there. He's gonna be executed if nothing happens. And why? He's gonna end up being a martyr. He'll end up being the second martyr, if you will, uh, depending on, on the timeline, but he may end up being either the first or the second martyr for Christ if something doesn't happen. And he's sleeping, and something or someone shows up and is kicking him in the side and tells him to wake up and get up and what? And go. So he goes, he goes to the house where the rest of the disciples are. He knocks on the door. The servant girl, Rhoda, comes to answer the door. She sees him standing there. And I think it's one of the funniest scenes is that she's so shocked by it, she leaves him there and leaves and goes. But what's interesting is that when she says it to them, they say, you're out of your mind. But she insisted that it was so, and then they said, it isn't him, it's his angel. Which by the way, Peter finds that out. Peter realizes that. As a matter of fact, when he tells them the story, he says, he, he says what he said when he came to, it says in, in, cha, in verse 11, it says, he came to himself and said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod. All of a sudden he comes to himself. So the, the presence of the angel with him wasn't, wasn't quite real to him. It wasn't quite a dream. It wasn't quite real. We know that there has to be some sort of physical substance to the angel because it literally was kicking him in the side to wake him up. But the relationship is vague, isn't it? So they have a relationship with angels the way that I hear some people talk about angels today. Do we all have a guardian angel? Okay, you don't have to answer this out loud if you don't want to, but how many of you have a walking, talking relationship with your guardian angel? I don't, but I'm not saying that you can't, but there's something different. <laughs> There's something that keeps a distance, if you will, between angels and humans. Amen? What I can tell you about angels is that they're not human. They're not us, are they? I heard a comedian once. I love this comedian. But she grew up in parochial school, and she had one nun that opened every class by saying, everybody move over in your seats just a little bit to make room for your angel. 
And so the comedian says, I don't know what you believe about your guardian angel, but apparently my guardian angel is fat and does not have the ability to hover. That's all I know about angels. So there's this mysterious relationship, and I want to say mysterious first century relationship between these Hebrews and angels. They've got divine power. It's been proven in the scriptures. They have divine power, and sometimes they carry the wrath, if you will, of God, don't they? They can carry destruction. As a matter of fact, coming out of Egypt, the last plague was supposed to be carried out by an angel. The angel of what? The angel of death. So uh, obviously, the, the angel's proof that they come from God is that they have divine, supernatural-like power. God does too, doesn't he? And he was exhibiting that at Sinai. And was Israel real thrilled about having a walking, talking relationship with that divine power? No. So they probably don't desire that kind of walking, talking relationship with an angel, if an angel can walk and talk. Like I said, it's a, it's a mysterious relationship because I will tell you that when the angels of the Lord, three of the angels of the Lord show up to walk with Abraham, Abraham doesn't distinguish between them being angels and actually being God, right? And the same with Jacob. He wrestles with an angel of God, but when he gets done with the experience, he says, I've seen God face to face. So what I'm trying to say is that the author of Hebrews is saying that your relationship with angels is just as insufficient as the relationship with the prophets. God could be satisfied with that. He could be satisfied with just sending you the prophets and sending you the angels and he could stay on Sinai and just be cool. And if he didn't love us, that would be okay for him. But the author of Hebrews is saying, no, the relationship with angels aren't enough either. As a matter of fact, humans don't really listen to angels too terribly much. Donkeys do. But humans? Hmm. Because every time that an angel encounters a human in the New Testament, the first words he has to say is what? Fear not. See, if they were just humans with wings, eh, I'm not sure I'd be fearing, would you? In fact, I'd think it's kind of cool. But no, he has to tell them, fear not. And I say he. We don't know, do we? And you say, well, 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 pastor, you know, Mary did what the angel said. John did what the angel said, right? The shepherds did what the angel said. Yeah, but they did it because they were what? They were afraid. In fact, before Mary pronounces her poem, it says Mary was so afraid, right? And we spent the last 13, 14 weeks talking about fear and the worship of God, didn't we? Does that mix in the equation of the worship of God? Does fear ever mix in the equation in the God that is love? No. So obviously, what? The relationship with angels are as insufficient as the relationship with the prophet. In fact, Hebrews will continue to say so. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited, speaking of this son, is more excellent than theirs. The relationship with the prophets is not enough for God. The relationship with the angels, as a matter of fact, this son who he has spoken to us through in the last days, his inheritance is much more excellent than theirs, he says. For which, to, which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? Uh, verse five in Hebrews one. I have begotten you. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. What angel has he ever said that to, he said? Angels are angels. Supernatural, divine, powerful. Awe-inspiring, fear-inspiring. But 
Not one of them ever had God turn to him and say, you are my son. They aren't the son. And again, when he brings firstborn into the world, he says, let all angels worship him, verse six says. Even angels worship the son. Angels are cruel, they've got power. But of angels, he says in verse seven, he says, he makes his angels winds and servants flames of fire. Man, that is cool. But, but to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Angels have divine power. They, they could be fire itself, if you will. But the Son is the very throne of God, and it lasts forever. There's no more power after that. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, speaking to the Son again. Remember, he's speaking to the Son, not to the angels. Anointed you with gladness, the gladness of your companions. The Son just doesn't have supernatural power, which Jesus did, did he not? But he also had the most powerful weapon of them all, and that was his righteousness, if he was willing to give to the unrighteous. Angels can do a lot, but they cannot bring righteousness, according to the author of Hebrews. And get this too, there's one other thing that angels cannot do. The last, word, last lines in verse nine. With the oil of gladness beyond your companions. The son has what? He has friends. The angels don't have friends. At least not here. Ah, oh, I didn't even get an amen. I got some nods. Did you just hear what he said? What makes the son the son better than angels, better than the relationship through prophets is that he can make friends. The word become flesh can walk and talk and be our friend and make us his friend and we can walk and talk with him with no fear, absolute trust. He's not gonna turn that divine power loose on us, ever. And if we can hold on with the sun, in the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth and the heavens, the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing, like a cloak. You will roll them up. Like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. So he says, to which one of them did he ever say that to? But to which of the angels, verse 13, he concludes with the angels, has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for beneath your feet? Angels are good. Prophets are good. But which one, who of them can give us the power of all creation and invite us to sit at his right hand while he conquers all forever to make sure that we could stay there at his right hand. His constant presence, never ever to be feared, ever. His constant full presence to never be feared. So that's why he says, but in the last days, he's spoken to us by a son of whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created all the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen. See, not just a glimpse. Moses got a glimpse. Moses got to see what no one else could see, but it wasn't full, was it? It wasn't complete, it wasn't face to face. It wasn't that God was lying about his relationship to, with Moses. What God was saying was, my relationship with Moses is as face to face as it can be. 
that not even Moses could see him face to face. And it's simple, why? It's very simple, why? It's not because Moses was still a sinner. It's not because Moses was 99% righteous and he struck the rock for lack of faith and, and so he still had that little bit of sin. These are all reasons that I've heard of why God could not fully expose himself to Moses. No, the answer is much simpler than that. He couldn't see God fully face to face because the sun had not come yet. See, but once the sun comes, we behold him now face to face. Not satisfied with his back. Not satisfied being covered up with with his hand as he passes by. Moses got God's back and he got him as he was passing by. You and I, because of the sun, we get God's face and he never, ever passes you by. If he does, he takes you with him. If he's got somewhere to go, he'll take you with him. See, I think that that's what the transfiguration was all about. Ed shared with us that what Peter said was we heard a voice that day. We heard a voice from the mountain, if you will. On this other mountain is when God shows up. He finally shows up and the, the, the people, the children of Abraham finally come up to see him. The Mount of Transfiguration is him finally being able to come down a mountain, blow the trumpet, and have God's children come up. By the way, it happened on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus comes down the mountain, comes, comes there, and the children come up the mountain to greet him. You see it all through. Why? Because he's this son that Hebrews is talking about. He's this son. He's spoken to us now with his son. And when that happens, his children go up the mountain. I think he did it for the children. For Peter, James, and John that day, I think he did it for them. They get to experience what their grandfathers never, ever experienced before because their grandfathers stood at a distance and were afraid. Peter, James, and John had held, had, was holding God by the hand, walking up the mountain. But the beautiful thing, too, is that he finally gives Moses his reward also. Moses gets to see him face to face. So when God goes back to the kingdom, he doesn't have a testimony anymore. He doesn't tell the angels and the few other humans that are there, I got close, I got close, I got to see his back. He goes back this day and he and Elijah can go back and say, we've seen him face to face. And by the way, their discussion was this purification for sins. The discussion was they were talking about Jesus' exodus, it says. It all comes together, doesn't it? The author of Hebrews knows that and wants us to journey there with him. One last wrap up, if you will, and that is this discussion about angels and how effective their message can be. We were just studying in prayer meeting that after the crucifixion, none of the disciples believe in the resurrection. He's been resurrected, and not one of his followers believe that he is. So the disciples, which includes Mary, formerly Mary Magdalene, she doesn't believe either. As a matter of fact, she's the one that comes up, comes up with the story that they must have stolen his body. And we studied this, we looked, and she, she sees the empty tomb, and she goes and gets the disciples, and they come, and they see the empty tomb, and they all conclude the same thing, and that's what? His body's been stolen, which means none of them believe in the resurrection. So there was a time, if you will, that the brand new church, the brand new Christian church did not believe the most fundamental doctrine about Christianity, and that is that he had been risen. I want to concentrate on Mary because she saw something that the other disciples didn't. In verse 12 of chapter 20, it says, when she goes back, after they go home and she comes back to the tomb, she sees two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the other. 
And they even speak to her. They say, woman, why are you weeping? She says to them, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. She sees angels. She sees a, a, a revelation of God's supernatural power. He sent two of these supernatural messages to talk to her. They give her a message. They ask her why she's weeping and what's her story? People say he's been resurrected, but I don't believe that. The angel's message has no impact on her. None. She doesn't believe. Still doesn't believe. A lot of us think, man, boy, if I could get an angel to show up, if I could just get an angel to show up to tell me what's going to happen, if I could just get an angel to show up to reveal to me what's on God's mind, oh, I'd be such a dedicated follower. She's got two of them, and she still doesn't what? She still doesn't believe. But she says this, and she turns around, and she sees Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was Jesus. What? And he says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Listen to this. Supposing to be the gardener, Supposing to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. See, the message still isn't about her. He just asked why she's weeping. He doesn't have anything for her. He's standing there himself. It's not angels anymore. He's standing there, but the message still has no what? No impact on her. No impact on her faith. No impact on her belief. Then Jesus says to her, Mary. She turns and says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. See, when the son sat down at the right hand of God, he did it after the purification of sins. He's died to, to assure Mary that her purification is done. See, one of the reasons she may not have believed the message is maybe she doesn't want to face the world where there is not a resurrected Jesus because when he was alive, he told me I was forgiven. When he was alive, he told me I was safe. When he was alive, he told me that I was somebody. And now she's just desperate even to find his body. See, but he says Mary, and he doesn't use the word Magdalene. Mary. We noted in a uh, uh, in, in in prayer meeting that a that a commentator says, when the Creator speaks your name, power happens. Yes. Prophets, that's good. That's good. Angels, that's good. But without the Son. Nothing. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Welcome to the message to the Hebrews. God's last day, radiance. I think this is going to be fun.